the loose side I was up against, very unassuming, long haired. I've later on found out he was early 40s. I thought he was late 30s. And he looked a bit like a 80s porn star. And um, his name, I can't remember his first name, but his nickname is Shagger Wilson. And I've been told this <laughs> recently. And he, lit- he literally put my head up my arse for 80 minutes that day. And I was, I just, I came off the pitch and I just shook his hand and I said, fair play. You've given me a lesson in rugby today. It doesn't matter how good you were last week, how good you were next week. You underestimate your opponent and you try and solve everything by yourself. Even though I've got 30 kilos on you, you're going to punish me. And, you know, and hand hand on heart to this day, that was the toughest scrummaging competition I've had in my career so far. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Corrigan and this is the Journey Continues podcast where we speak to interesting individuals about how they've navigated the challenges in their lives. Our mission is not to provide advice but it's 100% to provide insight into what our guests were thinking and feeling through these challenging times so that you can cherry pick the information that resonates with you the most. Today's guest is Xander Bakerson, a professional rugby player. Xander has played at the highest level of the sport, both at international and club level, including at the World Cup in 2019. And today we're going to explore Xander's journey and how he's overcome some of the challenges along the way. So Xander, welcome. Thank you for being here. I am mega excited for this one. Thanks for having me, Michael. Really appreciate it and uh, looking forward to getting stuck in. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Lots to talk about. So, yeah, I mean, how did it all kind of, how did, where did the journey start for you? I started my rugby journey when I was, I've always grown up in a rugby family. Um, so my grandfather, long story short, my grandfather was the chaplain at Rannick School. Um, so his claim to fame is he taught Tom Smith uh, all his ball handling skills. You know, he was, he was the basketball coach. He said Tom Smith was a phenomenal ball player. And he claims that that's why he's so good at rugby. But that's a story for another day. But yeah, so <laughs> grandfather uh, grew up in Rannick. So Rannick school, dad played for the first 15 all the way through. Dad loved his rugby. And I think growing up, dad had always had the incentive that he'd love to, he'd love for me to play rugby. So I didn't ever get pushed into it. I was allowed to do anything I wanted. But um, when I, at school, we started playing when I was six. It was touch rugby. And I wasn't that involved, you know, I wasn't couldn't really get a grasp of it because there was no contact. I was rubbish at football. I was rubbish at t- touch rugby because I wasn't very fast. I was thinking, what am I going to do? MMA, wrestling, maybe. I've got two younger brothers, so it was definitely good practice. But I think when I went when I was eight and we started doing contact rugby, I sort of like I knew this was a sport for me. You got to tackle people and you didn't get in trouble for it. And I was just like, tick, 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 sign me up. So um, <laughs> yeah, fell in love with it ever since then. Um, I was at Dundee High School. And that's when I fell in love with it. And then sort of it's just grown from there. Um, I think definitely having little brothers is definitely good to practice your three on twos and your choke tackling and stuff. But uh, um, yeah, definitely. Once we started doing contact at eight, I just fell in love with the sport ever since then. That's really cool. When did you know that you were going to be professional? When did you make that decision? Yeah, so I was quite late on in my career, actually. Um, I had two loves growing up, mountain biking and rugby. And so in the winter months, I could do the mountain biking. By the time I got home from school, I'd go, um, I'd, I'd, it was too dark. I just couldn't do it. And I wasn't a big fan of um, riding in the dark. So I just started, started doing a bit of s getting ready for the rugby season. And so I had to make a decision when I was about 16. Um, I got a scholarship to Strat Island School. Um, I was very lucky to get picked up by um, Andy Henderson, the head of rugby there. I left Dundee High School, went to Strath, and yeah, they, they didn't make me they didn't make, make me make a decision. But if the head coach of the rugby department, Andy, was sort of like, if you give this a proper a proper go at it, you know, and really invest your time and and work on your work on your work ons and stuff, I think you could definitely have a career in this. Um, mm. It was also at that time that I got moved from number eight to prop, and so that was a bit of a transition for me, you know, um, going from the back of the scrum. Being the ball player, I wasn't very good at it, but being the ball player and then going to the front and doing this, the propping and stuff, you know, I, I had a few sore necks that, that year um, leaving school, but I actually only thought I was going to make it when I was about 18. So I left school and all the coaches were telling me, if you want to make it professionally in rugby, you either need to move to Edinburgh or Glasgow. 
just because that's where the Prem 1 teams are. You need to get mm-hmm. some exposure to adult rugby. You're a big guy, but we need to see how you hold up in there. So I didn't get a contract straight out of school. Um, and I was also, I signed up, I was going to go to, um, I was going to do a gap year go to New Zealand um, to do the mountain biking and the ski season. And so I got I got talked into going to Glasgow. Um, my girlfriend was living in Glasgow at the time, and I managed to wangle my way with mum and said, "I didn't work very hard in my last year at school. I met my now wife, but my girlfriend at the time, you know. Um, let me have another crack at that at college just to keep mum happy, and I'll go to Glasgow Hawks, which is a great team um, that I know a few of the guys and a few of the coaches, and I'll, I'll give it a proper go. And so I only found out I think it was February time that I was actually going to get stage three. So yeah, it, it was a lot, a lot later than other people, but um, I wouldn't change it for the world. Definitely gave me a lot of life perspective, and um, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed my journey up to now. Yeah, that's awesome. Through that journey, who were you looking up to? Who were the role models for you when you were starting out? I think for me, as, as a number eight, you know, I think the pure space, um, just how physically he was for South Africa and the way he carried the ball was definitely one of the guys I, I watched a lot of. Um, and then as soon as I moved to Tighthead, the obvious choice was you Murray, you know. Um, he was coming to his prime at the time. He was yeah. a lion, you know. And yeah. then also getting a sort of a hero of mine growing up because of his Christianity and his faith as well. Because mm. I've come from a Christian home. So he was my sort of poster boy at Tighthead. And then actually going to Glasgow when it, in, in the final stages of his career and getting to sort of learn off him and him be my mentor, I, I was really lucky. So... For me, a hero of mine grew up was Hugh Murray, definitely. That's brilliant. It must have been amazing playing with you, Murray, as well, some player. What was it like playing youth rugby growing up, getting to travel the world and play teams from all around the world and play best in class or the best in class at your age group? Unbelievable. Um, some of my favourite memories of playing rugby were at the under-20s World Cups, you know, I was really lucky and privileged. I got to play in three. So my first one was, um, it was in the year out after school when I was at college and we went, I played a whole under 18 programme. We went to Portugal, first of all, with under 18s, which were all my, my peers and stuff and my teammates. I've, I've gone through the ages with, uh, which was awesome. And so I had a great time there for, I think it was two weeks, three weeks. And then in that summer, went to New Zealand for a month and it was just the best trip. We didn't play that great rugby, but like, seeing that side of the world and, you know, and you get put up in a fancy hotel, everything's covered. I couldn't believe it. And the food was unbelievable as well. And as for a tight head, that's your, a tick in my box. Um, so I absolutely love that. And then the, the other twenties, the next year we went to Italy, which was, we were in Brescia, a smaller, smaller part of Italy that you'd never have gone to otherwise. And sort of, yeah, very quiet, very country. I absolutely loved it. You can see the knees in the background in training, unreal. And then the final one was Manchester, which you'd, be, you'd laugh at me telling how much fun Manchester was. But with a, a group of 30 lads, we, we had the best time, you know, based up in <laughs> Bury. We were playing golf and days off. We were in the village hotel, just having such a good laugh. But then recent, in recent times, you know, been to Fiji, been to Australia, been to Japan. Yeah, rugby's given me so many amazing trips and amazing stories that I'll be able to tell the kids when they're a bit older. Yeah, that's that's amazing. One of the questions I have to ask you is, have you ever had to face the hacker, be it from New Zealand or the Samoan or Tongan versions? Yeah, so under 20s tournament, um, our third game was against New Zealand. So in New Zealand, playing the All Blacks, the junior All Blacks in New Zealand, it doesn't get much bigger than that. The whole stadium we're playing in... um, the county's Manukau Stadium, which is like the Chiefs sort of ITM Cup team, all places rammed, all their families are around, and our coach was actually Kiwi. And so the whole the build up to the week, we'd actually went to um, a small team called, oh, what was the team called? I can't remember. We went to like a, a small club team on the outskirts, all fully grown men. I was 17, my first <laughs> experience of sort of proper adult rugby, and they had this these massive Samoan Tongan Islanders. It was terrifying, but loved it. Um, and then we played the Junior All Blacks. And it was just, yeah, it was pretty spine tingling. I think we we built up to the week. We were thinking we, we, we've got a good chance. We had a great team on paper. It was actually one of the only games I started that tournament. And we, we went all right. You know, scrum for me was going okay. But we came in, I think it was 34-7. We got an intercept try. And I remember mm-hmm. walking in the tunnel. And John Lomu, who I think he'd been diagnosed with um, 
his kidney problems. So he'd lost a lot of weight, so I barely recognized him. But he was just shaking all these bo- There's this guy shaking everyone's hands going in there. I was thinking, who's that? Shook his hand. And he looked vaguely familiar. And then the boys were like, did you see John Wooden? I was like, no way. So um, that was awesome. I think it actually ended up, the final score is about 68-14. So it wasn't our finest moment. Um, but yeah, unbelievable experience. And then I also played them the year later in Italy um, against the, the Junior All Blacks. And I've been lucky enough to uh, I faced the All Blacks at Murrayfield. Um, I got a Stony Bill right shoulder just before halftime. So I got knocked out. Um, <laughs> Would have been a red card, definitely in these in these days, but um, yeah, it's still a pretty amazing experience. So, what's it like when you face the hacker? What's going through your mind? You watch some teams, and some people turn away. Some people look quite calm. Some people even advance. Some people you can see in their eyes; they are really up for the match that's ahead. What's going through your mind? What's it like? You know, I love it. It's um, confrontation, and I think. Being a front row player, especially confrontation is what I thrive on. You know, I, I love it. So to see how passionate they are about and, and what it means to them, you know, it just excites me and gets me ready for the game. You know, I, I know they're going to bring it. So I've got to bring it myself, you know. So when I'm when I'm facing the hacker, I'm just thinking about what's my first role? What am I going to do in the game to impose myself in the game? You know, and like if, if it's our ball, what's the restart going to be? Am I going to be chasing? Or am I going to be receiving? Am I going to have to lift and line up? You know, so I'm just thinking about my role and how I can influence the game as quickly as possible when I'm watching it. Um, but it, it definitely, from watching it from a young age and then actually facing it, it definitely, it, it gets you going. The hairs on your back go up, you know, it's quite cool. I love it. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. One of my favourite players is Rich McCaw, I guess. He would be um, a lot of people's favourite player and it's one of these things where, you know, he's when he's playing, he's talked about as a great leader, but it's not until he leaves the game that you realise how good a leader he actually was. And he was phenomenal. And I think what they did between really 2005 to not do well or do as well as they could have in 2007, but then to turn around and win the World Cup in 2011 and in 2015 is incredible. There's one game that specifically stands out to me, and I think it's in 2012 or 13. They're playing New Zealand. New Zealand are playing Australia in the Tri Nations, and Australia are ahead. They score a penalty, and New Zealand need to get a converted try. And they go down the field. There's a turnover. New Zealand lose the ball. They get it back. And then I think it's Fekatoa managed to, to slide into the try, and I'm pretty sure. Carter was it playing, I think Slade was playing, and he uh, scores the conversion and compares the try. And yeah, I just think everything they, they did was amazing. And I think um, that team and how strong they were is it's pretty phenomenal, actually. Massively. And I think what well, I've now got a, a much more appreciation of Richard McCaw as well as sort of his work rate and how much actual stuff he went through in the game. You know, look mm. at stats and stuff. When you're watching the game on TV, you don't really see that. You don't really see the small things like rut clears or that work rate to get back and kick chase. But watching some of his old games now and like reading some of the stats and hearing about what player, ex players have to say about him, it just seems like, yeah, he led by example, but also did his talking on the pitch as well as off the pitch, you know? So what a guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll get back to some of the All Black stuff in a moment, but I'd like to get back to you and focus on that. What was it like when you made the step up to professional rugby? There's always a uh, step up in intensity between the levels. What was that like? I think when people tell you it's faster, more physical, they're not lying. Um, I think going from even playing for Hawks in the Prem 1, you know, I didn't get that many chances playing first 15, but I was really lucky that when I left school, I had a whole season pretty much playing second 15, getting absolutely battered by guys who were gutted about not being the first, which <laughs> sort of set me up for professional professional rugby quite well. So mm-hmm. I was battle hard and getting ready into it. Um, but yeah, it's just way faster. The, the speed of ball, the speed of your reaction time is going to be a lot quicker as well as just that physical confrontation. The tackles are tougher. The, the breakdown is just you're getting melted off the ball. Um, and just your sort of, your speed of thought and just that time to sort of like the, especially in D as a, as a forward, especially with the back, you know, you get some guys in the, in the, in the adult leagues who can who can do you in a, in a, on a sidestep and out and they're gone compared to in the professional leagues it's like nearly every one of their back their backs can probably do you so you, you need to be make sure you're you're switched on at all moments 
you can't you can't lose concentration or get punished. Um, but I also think like this stuff for me scrums. Um, it's just more about your technique, you know. That's mm-hmm. the one thing I would say is professional rugby is just the basics done well consistently. Mm-hmm. That's the biggest step up. In, in adult rugby, you might have a knock on or a fumble and you can get the ball back and have a crack compared to in the pro games, there's the, the margin of error is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because yeah. all these teams are so well drilled. The basics are just, you have, they have to be world class. You know? And those are the teams that do really well. I think of Leinster, the way they recycle the ball and keep putting pressure on you, especially in your 22. That's why they're one of the best teams in Europe because they're yeah. relentless. They don't have an off button. They don't make that many mistakes, you know, when it's the time to, to execute, you know. It's, like, it's a lot more unforgiving. Massively, massively. Yeah. So, yeah, big question then. What are some of the biggest and best challenges you faced? I'd be interested to know that as a team and in a team sense, but I'd also be interested to know in a personal and individual sense as well and perhaps some of the individual battles on the field. Um, I'll go personal. The biggest challenge on the field, um, as, a, as a young tight head coming through, um, quite heavy, quite sure of myself. You know, left school, thought I was the man. I was 130 kilos, and I got I got away with a lot, a lot because I was so heavy. And I remember playing for Hawks Twos, and we were playing on the back pitches um, at Lock Inch on the 4G against Stu Mel Twos. And I, what's it called? The uh, loose head I was up against, very unassuming, long haired. I've later on found out he was early 40s. I thought he was late 30s. And he looked a bit like an 80s porn star. And um, his name, I can't remember his first name, but his nickname is Shagger Wilson. And I've been told <laughs> this recently. And he, lit- he literally put my head up my arse for 80 minutes that day. And I was, I just, I came off the pitch and I just shook his hand and I said, fair play, you've given me a lesson in rugby today. It doesn't matter how good you were last week, how good you were next week you underestimate your opponent and you try and solve everything by yourself, even though I've got 30 kilos on you, you're going to punish me. And, yeah. you know, and hand, hand on heart to this day, that was the toughest scrummaging competition I've had in my career so far. Wow. Um, and it's, it's really nice that I've actually, I've been connected with him a few times, a few mutual friends who sent me his email on Facebook and he actually sent me a really nice message to start this tournament. And um, so as soon as this is over, uh, COVID, I mean, uh, we're definitely going to go for a beer and he can tell me all his, the deep, dark arts of, of how he get, gave me nightmares for a few years. Um, <laughs> so that's a, that, that's a good one to start with. And I, I always find, like, especially journalists t- get taken aback, you know, you're an international rugby player and you've been destroyed by a guy who plays for CML 2s and that's the toughest competition. So this, it just shows you it doesn't matter who you think you are or whatever league you play in if, if you don't if you rest on your rest on your laurels and don't come up with, with the same attitude every week if it's a new challenge you, can't, you have to respect everyone you're going to get handed to um, the big one for me uh, the hardest challenge outside of my personal rugby challenge would be I'd say the World Cup you know um, I came back I snapped my ankle um, September 2018 over in South Africa mm-hmm. um, at a compound and no it wasn't a compound it was a fast dislocation so I got a plate in it. Um, I didn't know if I was going to play rugby again. And my wife was pregnant with our daughter, Iona, um, early on. So it was kind of quite a stressful time. Um, me coming back and rehabbing on that, not being able to help her, you know, and, and her having horrendous morning sickness and, and having to look after the t- our two dogs and me. And she's like, I'm not even, I don't, we don't even have a child yet. And I feel like I'm already a mum. So um, I have to give credit to Yasmin. Yasmin, my wife, was incredible during that time. Um, but sort of coming back from my ankle, I put so much pressure on myself to, to get back to where I was um, pre-injury. And I think I started off that season really well. I was in a great bit of form. I had a really solid pre-season. I just got married. Life was great. And I remember doing my ankle, I was thinking, yeah, I'm going to get back to that, you know, and I was so driven to get back. And I think I got back two or three weeks earlier than expected, played my first game against Cardiff um, and everything went well. I didn't play horrendously, had a few all right ball carry, scrum was okay. And I then got called back into the Scotland squad and we had a few injuries and I was on the bench against France the week later. And looking back, that was probably the worst decision I'd make. Um, if I could do it all again, I would just put my hand up and say, I'm not ready to play international rugby again. 
because I built up so much energy, you know, I'm back in the Scotland squad, I'm back to where I want to be, really happy. But then as the, as I got into the game, I just wasn't ready for it. You know, I'd only played one game of pro rugby in, what, six, seven months. And international rugby is pretty unforgiving. Yeah. And so first scrum, I got scrum, scrum penalty. I thought, oh, this is it. I'm back. No worries. And then they were on our line for the next, the last five minutes of the game. And I got absolutely hosed two or three times, you know. And I just remember coming off the game thinking, I started off with this euphoria. I'm back, buzzing. And I've come off with, I'm absolutely gutted. I made it... I, I've let the boys down. I wasn't ready for this, you know, and I think I didn't play the rest of that Six Nations. Um, I was 24th man and I sort of, I went down to England with the team and watched them draw 38 all, you know, and I was so happy for the boys with that result, even though I think we should have won and if we played for 80 minutes, we could have beat them. But at the same time, I was like so gutted that I also wasn't a part of it. And, I sort of carried that burden with me to the end of the season. You know, we got to the final of the Pro 14 in Glasgow, a highlight of my career, um, especially as it was Iona's first game. Iona was born the week before. And so I was, yeah, in a really great place and didn't play awful, didn't play amazing, but a really special day for the club. And I just wish we could have got the result. Um, a few things didn't go our way, you know, and uh, we lost that one. But yeah, I went into World Cup prep, you know, think, oh, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. I'll, I'll get away, you know, and I, I really I really wasn't enjoying my rugby at all. Um, and I remember getting to the World Cup and I'd set my benchmark for my, my injury as I want to start the first six the World Cup game. The game against Ireland, that's my pinnacle. If I start that game, I know that I've, I've done enough to get there, you know. And, and VP and Berge played great. Um, and I remember getting, we got to Japan, got to Nagasaki, the two weeks before we played Ireland. Um, and we did our training. It was awesome, amazing country. I don't know if you've been, Michael, but the, the amazing people, amazing country and culture and stuff. And um, just absolutely loving life. And I remember getting, I think it was earlier on in the first week, I got told I wasn't going to be, be playing. I wasn't playing at all in the Ireland game. And I just remember going to my room, you know, and yeah, I, I just broke down, you know, uh, called, called my wife, just absolutely gutted, crying. And I was just like, I just want to come home. I just haven't enjoyed rugby at all. I haven't enjoyed the whole preseason. I've been away from you. It was really, really tough. And I remember I called mum and dad as well, you know, and they both, my wife and my mum and dad gave me both the same message. You know, they said, you've worked so hard to come back from your ankle injury. You've done all this extra training. You, you, you've put in all you can to get there, but you, you're letting one thing just sort of hold you back. You know, you're not enjoying your rugby. You're not enjoying training. And what Yaz said to me, luckily she was coming over with Iona and my mother-in-law and father-in-law the week after. And she said to me, she goes, just go have fun. She says, you've loved rugby since you were six years old. Just go and if you're not playing, be the best teammate you can be, you know, energize the boys, change your role. Instead of thinking I need to be the starting tight head, instead of I need to be the best 24th man there is. If they, if they need to do extra passing, do the extra passing, you know, and, it was really, it was the best advice you could have given me, you know, that whole that whole mental shift and I'm going to enjoy the World Cup for what it is. There's some players that get to, they play their whole Scotland career, get 50, 60 caps and every World Cup cycle they get injured. So to even mm -hmm. make it to a World Cup is a privilege. So I'm playing for my country, I'm representing my country and I said, whatever happens, when I get my next opportunity, if that's on the bench against Samoa, if that's on the bench against Russia, I'm just going to love it and enjoy it for what it is and make the most of it. And I just remember... The week later, I got I was on the bench against Samoa, and I just like that whole week I was just buzzing around like a little kid at Christmas because I was like, I'm gonna get the opportunity, I'm just gonna enjoy it, and I was so happy in training, smiling, laughing, having crack with my teammates, you know. And G Gordy Reid was on that tour, and he's a he's a really funny guy, so me and him are good mates as well. So we had a great time that week, and I was laughing away, having a great time, and, and uh, yeah, Iona came over with Yasmin and my mother-in-law, father-in-law, and they were at the Samoa game, which made it even more special. And I just remember. Afterwards, it was like a burden had been lifted. It was just sort of like, this is a new start. I'm back to enjoying my rugby. I'm back to taking rugby for what it is. The rugby, rugby, I love rugby, but rugby isn't just me. You know, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm yeah. a son. You know, rugby isn't going to be the making making of me. I'm going to enjoy rugby for what it is. And ever since then, yeah, I've just I've really been enjoying my rugby and I've been enjoying training and enjoying the little things. And for me personally, I feel my game's got better and better. So... Uh, long may it continue. Yeah, that's an incredible story. I think mindset's a really interesting thing because to 
when you're at the start of that journey, it can seem like quite a big change. And often when you put it into words retrospectively, it sounds like quite a simple thing. But when you're able to put things in the right perspective and the right place in life, when you're when you're not fully defined by the thing that is your craft, you're able to almost enjoy it more and be and be more involved in the process. And because of that, you perform better. Massively. And I think the birth of Iona was like just put everything into perspective, you know. Yeah. It doesn't matter how well I play the weekend. As soon as I come home, I'm dad. It's like with the dogs. I love the dogs because I could have a shocker and come back and they're going to lick me to death. Or I could, have, I could have the best game ever and they're still going to lick me to death, you know. So, um, yeah, <laughs> the best thing that um, happened to me was having my daughter 100%. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. That's, that's amazing. How do you guys prepare for matches? What's the preparation process like? What's the, what's the routine like from a high level? So I'll take you through it personally for me. So sort of Mondays will be meetings, a bit of gym, getting the body moving again, and then sort of what the theme of the week is and how we're going to prepare for this team. And then Tuesday will be a bit more physical. Um, so a bit more full contact training, scrums and malls in the morning and lineups, making sure our lineups are all prepared. And then, uh, sorry, and gym again. Wednesday is usually at Glasgow will be a day off, but... Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll use it for Glasgow terms. So Glasgow will be a day off and then Thursday come back in. It's a really short, sharp session. It's sort of when the players take a, more of a leadership role and run the session. And so um, I'll uh, I'll do a few plays and then a few scrums and lineups, a lot more condensed, maybe an hour and a half of intense training. And then on Thursday, captains run, go through our three or four moves, very low key, 70%. And then come, come Saturday, um, game day, let's go. Yeah, and then one of the things I wanted to ask as well was, how do you set goals as a, as a rugby player? In business, we think a lot about what we're, what we're going to do 5, 10, 15 years down the line. And then it's about, as the future becomes more apparent, we'll start to make those goals more bite-sized chunks um, and work towards those things. How do you do that as a player? So I think you can, you can have personal goals, sort of similar to that, you know, um, like one for me would be, I want to be the best tight end in the world and sort of my goals then are switched to that. So what key area of my game this week am I going to improve? And I think that getting better every day mindset, sort of that's something I've adopted since the World Cup. It's just little, little things uh, often to try and make myself better. You know, I, I feel if you focus too much on too many things, it just sort of you get, you're not thinking, you're not focused on that key area compared to rugby is such a such, such a quick turnaround say one week I'm like right I'm going to do pick and goes this week next week's going to be defence but for me like we always do goal setting before I, I personally always do goal setting before a game mm-hmm. and I've, I've really shifted from when I was younger it was sort of right I want to make 10 tackles five of them have to be dominant and I don't want to miss any and then it has to be like oh I want to get four ball carries get over the game line compared to now it's all about right What's the key thing for me to bring it the best to me is going to be enjoyment. So I want to enjoy it, first of all. Second thing, what do I need to do to help the team win? So, okay, solid set piece. So I need to do my roles in the line out and I need to do my process in the scrum. If I do my process and tick those boxes, I know that I've done everything I can to help the set piece function. And then like third thing would be like maybe, okay, they've got a try and try to take away the personal thing out of it and the sort of the statistics and stuff and just make it more enjoyment and ones that you can sort of measure a lot more easy compared to if I put down, I need to make 10 tackles and I make eight, does that mean I've had a bad game? No, it just means I haven't hit my goal. So um, if that makes sense, you take away the personal, the statistics side out of it and make it a lot more general and then you can address it and measure it on that level a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. And then, what motivates you? Then? Is it is it enjoyment of the game, or do you, or do you? Is it is it visualizing a moment? Like what pulls you through the tough times? Um, pulls me through the tough times. Uh, yeah, just enjoyment. I I I never want to be someone to let my teammates down. I think that's the one for me. You know. Um, yeah. If if I could, if I do a, watch a review and they've scored a try, and I if I'd worked a little bit harder at the start to get back, and I could have got a cover tackle in, and I've not done it because I was being lazy that would break me a lot more than 
if it was a scrum, the scrum dropped and got a penalty, um, it's never good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that at all. But I would be a lot more gutted about if an individual action could have prevented something and I could have helped the team out, you know. Um, but what gets me through the dark times, um, yeah, the boys just want to... I'm really good mates with everyone, so I don't want to let anyone down. And sort of, I'm one of those guys that if I see someone slacking a little bit, I'll pull them up and I hope they feel they can pull me up. And I know for a fact a lot of the backs do. So I said, come on, Xander, stop walking, get moving. So, um, <laughs> and little things, little things like that. But the key one for me is I just want to make my family proud. Uh-huh. Um, and I think if my, if, my, if my kids are watching a game and the way I handle myself, I conduct myself, I want to make them proud and they can go away saying I'm proud of dad instead of when I was younger, I was a bit more hot-headed, you know, and getting a few little scraps and that's just not me. Um, so I'd rather focus on the things that I can control and, and be the best at that instead of things outside of my control, just don't get involved in, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, completely agree, like, and completely understand wanting to make your family proud, get that one big time. And then you mentioned a little bit about the the backs there as well. In the book Legacy about the All Blacks, it talks about the the very defined culture that they built. Is that something that the Scotland rugby team have as well? So, yeah, so just in the Scotland aspect, you know, just sort of our non-negotiables, you know, just like being on time and always working hard, you know, respectful, packing with the coaches. You know, we're really lucky that we've got a fantastic team around us as well as the players. And we get so well looked after that there's sort of, there's no reason why, you know, our kit man, Bealsy, Mark Beals, absolute legend. Um, and he'd do anything for you. He'd change your boots. He'd stretch your boots, clean them if you wanted them to. But all he asks is you pack away your kit and you, you put it away in the laundry bin and he'll get it ready for you the next day and make sure everything's prepped. So that respect aspect is massive, you know, it's the little things like littering and stuff, you know. You don't yeah. think of it as a small thing, but if you leave a ball behind a training session, it's sort of it's just sort of holding holding boys accountable to, to that level of standard. We want to be the best team in the world. We want to be an elite team and striving for trophies and stuff. If you don't do the fundamentals and the basics, when you get to that top end stuff, standards start to drop. You know, t- think of it like as I was saying about kick chase. It's just sort of non-negotiable. You buy into the team ethos and you just do your role and you got to live by those standards. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then, do you guys have any? rituals to remind yourselves of the culture so the most obvious one is the all blacks and they do the haka before every game to remind themselves of who they are where they come from what the history is and they're very much tied back to that through that process do you guys have anything like that when i was watching the the last scotland and england game there was a huddle before or after the game i can't remember but there was something there i was and i was quite interested in that yeah, nah, so we always do a huddle um, before every game and before every training session, at the end of every training session. And usually we'll get the key leaders to speak about key focus points for the rest of the session and stuff. And, and Hoggy will have the final word as captain. But you always get the, we always have the youngest player in the squad, um, which is usually Darcy Graham. Um, he, he says Univery, and we all say Kayla, which is sort of together as one in Gaelic. Um, so that's one of the key rituals for us and that just sort of helps you focus in on the session you know that's the start of the session this is the switch you know we talk about flicking a switch in professional sport and and now it's go time focus focus the session and as soon as we finish you can have a laugh and joke around at the end that's awesome that's awesome i love that that's that's brilliant something i wanted to ask as well in terms of you know preparation and, and everything 2020 the last year has been really difficult for everyone. I was speaking to an Olympic athlete a few days ago and she was saying that, I mean, obviously that schedule has just been completely ripped up. Fingers crossed the Olympics still go ahead for everyone this year, but, you know, a schedule that's still, and usually is very, very rigid, is still very fluid. I mean, I think they're still to do their trials for the Olympics, which is, I think, it's obviously a very... Uh, it's an unprecedented situation. I'd be interested to know how the last year has been for you and what that's meant for, for your preparation. And then also, when this all started at the very beginning, it was almost like something in a land far, far away. It wasn't here. And all of a sudden, it was here really, 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 really quickly. 
So it was quite quite visceral. A lot of people seem to have a, a moment where the penny dropped and it was real. What was that for you? Penny drop for me massively um, was, as you said, end of the Six Nations last year. We were supposed to be playing Wales, down in Wales. We'd, um, we'd heard whispers about it after the France game. Um, that went ahead. And then the whole training week, we're sort of, is it on, is it off? We got confirmation it was definitely going to be on. We flew down on the Friday. We're walking around, going, went out for breakfast that morning because it was captain's day. So went out for breakfast and a coffee with the boys. And we're on the bus, the captain's run. And yeah, game got game had been postponed and cancelled because of the pandemic. And we got a bus back to Scotland that night. And we pretty much got told by our team doc, he says, this is going to be worldwide. He called it, he called it a week before. And he said to me, he said, look after the family. I won't see you for a couple of months. So, and I said, Doc, you've been crazy. I'll be back here and I'll be back here for summer tour, you know. And um, he says, you know, you won't be. Um, so he called it and I'll give him credit for that. Um, but I, I honestly didn't think it was going to kick off as much as it did until the Glasgow boys got sent home as well. Um, and all the, all the WhatsApps kicking off, you know, when we're back to training. Because as soon as you start professional rugby, you're literally, you're told when to gym, you're told when to eat and you're told when to go home. It's such a routine. You literally, you're, you're handheld the whole way through. You know exactly where you're going to be all day for the, the whole week. It changes on a daily basis. But um, yeah, definitely, Penny definitely dropped coming back from Wales. And I was thinking, this is crazy. You know, like, when are we going to play rugby again? And when was your first game since this all started? First game was middle of August. I think, I think it was 14th of August. Mm-hmm. And how did you prepare for that? So we we literally so we went home that day after Wales and we pretty much got told you're on you're definitely not going to be in next week or the week after so go away for three weeks whatever and um, so then of course the WhatsApp's kicking off right can I get a what bike can I get this can I get X Y and Z from the the S and C man was pulling his hair out and um, he's bald now and um, because he's literally driving around all of Glasgow dropping off all the equipment because I think they pretty much got a heads up that Scotland's going to be locked down completely so get as much equipment as you can out of Scotland. So I was really lucky um, that I got um, Jamie Dempsey, one of the guys, the Scottish carrier manager. He runs a CrossFit gym in Airdrie. And so I messaged him out of the blue and said, right, I know this is going to be a big thing. Can I just borrow some weight? So I was covered. I had a walk bike and I had um, a full gym rack and everything. So I got to train pretty hard. Um, but we got back to actually training, I think. It was originally start- through in Murrayfield and it was three days a week. You drove to Murrayfield, you got temperature, to temperature checked, you did weights in a, it was like a solitary confinement square um, with, with shields at the side for your protection. You had all your equipment there, you had an hour slot in there and you went onto the back pitches and you, you had a 20 metre running track. You could only do straight line running, you couldn't pass a ball. So that was for a month. And my wife gave birth to our son Hamish um, end of April. And so, because I had all my equipment already, I said to them, I'll do my running at West of Scotland in Glasgow. Give me a GPS so you can keep monitoring me, but I'll do the sessions. And I've got all the weights at home, probably more weights than you've got here. So I'll just do my weights at home. And they said, yeah, that's fine. It's on you though, to chip away. Because if you come into pre-season, you're not ready to go. We're going to hold you accountable. So I did that for a month, which was, which was tough. And um, trying to work out when the kids are sleeping. And we then came back to full on training in middle of May, I believe. And that was when we allowed to pass a ball. And it was originally just passing a ball, a bit of touch games. And then sort of grew, grew and grew. And then in, into August, the week, two weeks before, we could do full smash. And we were back at Scotchton, which was great fun. Um, so, yeah, no, I was just absolutely buzzing to play. Um, I'd, I'd done so much road running. I felt like I was a marathon runner. I, I think the most I did was 15K. Um, I nice. loved it. Just put my headphones in and got to go out and do a spin. I, put, I, 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 would, I went to bed and, and Yaz would be with Hamish. And I would um, I'd go out for an hour and a half run. I loved it. Um, so, yeah, I was just, I was like, you know what? Um, the key things I took from the pandemic would be, you know, don't take anything for granted. And so I was just buzzing to play, play rugby again. Um, I, I never usually liked playing against Edinburgh. But even though it was Edinburgh, I didn't care. I was just, I was smiling the whole time. I was really chompsy. So I, I actually, the missus, she gave me a telling off when I got home. She goes, I, all I heard the whole ref like was you shouting at the ref so next game make sure you don't do that and I, was like, yeah, <laughs> fair point, fair point. I was just so excited to do that uh-huh. so yeah now nah, just 
the feelings I had preparation wise, I was just like, I can't wait to play. Let's just fingers crossed it goes ahead because. I was just like, if one of us has a positive test, I'll cry. I just want to play rugby again. Uh-huh. So um, yeah, just absolutely buzzing. And even though we lo- even though we lost, I went home that night. I was on the phone to mom and to dad, to and my wife, to my little brother, like because he played as well. I talked to him on the way back to back to Glasgow. Just like, oh, how good was that? We're playing rugby again. I was just so happy. Because um, it's funny because it's it's all I've known since I was seventeen, and so to get that taken away from me. It, and people say, oh, it's, it's a sport, but to me, it's, it's, it's my livelihood, you know, and to get back to some sort of normality was massive. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then off the back of that, what are your plans for 2021? Plans for 2021, as I alluded to in the podcast, is just to keep enjoying, enjoying my rugby. Um, yeah, just, I think if I keep enjoying it, you know, um, if I play with a smile on my face, I'm going to gonna play my best rugby. So I want to keep doing that. Um, I'm, I'm available to play this week, so fingers crossed. Um, I play I play for someone at the weekend. Um, that's Glasgow, Scotland. So I'll find that later on in the week. Um, but yeah, just to keep enjoying my rugby, stay healthy, stay fit, and then see what happens. And I think just the key one for me outside of rugby is you know just be a good dad and be good be a good husband. I think what what, what this pandemic's taught me is just to enjoy the little things. Um, I like to live my life 100 miles an hour. And so we, we just had the birth of my son, Hamish. And I decided to rip up the whole back garden and landscape the whole back garden, mainly myself and a few of the boys um, when we were still on that furlough period. And so the early early weeks of uh, Hamish's life, I was doing full 12 hour days in the garden, absolutely knackered and, and not really enjoying the time with Hamish that I'd had with Iona before. So um, I definitely think I've got, I've got my balance a lot better now, you know, and so that's a key job for me ahead of rugby and ahead of everything else is just to, to be a good husband and, and be a good father and uh, keep that going for as long, the rest of my life. <laughs> 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 That's good. That's good. Final question then, where is the first place you're going to travel to when the world opens up again? I think the first place for me, I was I definitely, I would, I'd love to travel. It's going to be Portugal with the family and, um, in August 2019, we took my daughter, who was, um, she was only about, uh, what was she? She would have been three or four months and for a family holiday. And we absolutely had a great time, loved it. Um, so I think my son doesn't have, my son doesn't even have a passport yet, but we'll try and get one organised and we'll get over to Portugal as soon as we can. Good man, good man. Well, Xander, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure um, and it really means a lot. So thank you. To everyone who's watching this or listening to this, um, please subscribe or hit that bell if you're watching on YouTube. If you are listening to this on Spotify, please follow the podcast. If you are listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please subscribe. That would be great. We have a lot more content coming like this. I think you'll all really enjoy it. So please stay tuned and we really appreciate you watching this and listening to this. All the links where you can find Xander will be be below the video on YouTube and, of course, on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts as well. So we'll see you all very soon. In the meantime, please take care and speak soon. Thanks for having me, Michael. Really appreciate it.